Uh, it's my honor to introduce our next guest, Amy Berger. Amy is a veteran of the Air Force. We can clap for that. A certified nutritional specialist and a nutritional therapy practitioner who uses low-carbohydrate diets and teaches people to eat real foods. And it's our honor to have her at Low Carb Houston. Hello, everybody. Where is this the pointer? Okay. Um, I have a short time slot and a lot to say. I'm going to talk fast. I apologize in advance. Please listen as quickly as you can. Okay. Um, if, if I have a conflict of interest, it's that I wrote a book about Alzheimer's disease. It is available here for sale if you are interested, if this talk piques your interest, and I receive royalties from the book. Um, I don't think Gary Taubes is still with us today, but um, I want to give him credit because my book wouldn't exist without Good Calories, Bad Calories. Good Calories, Bad Calories is the first place I learned about a potential connection between glucose, insulin, and Alzheimer's disease, and that is where this came from. Um, let's talk about some Alzheimer's statistics. This is a really, really grim illness, no? Really grim. And it's grim because at least so far as we know, there's nothing we can do about it. There's no impact we can make on this disease. So I'm, I'm cut for time. The thing I want to look at here is um, the bottom one in red. Between, you know, in, in over a 15 year period, deaths from heart disease decreased 11%, while deaths from Alzheimer's increased 123%. That is a whopping, staggering increase. Now. If there's anything nice, anything kind we can say about Alzheimer's disease, it's that Alzheimer's doesn't discriminate, right? It's an equal opportunity killer. It doesn't care how much money you have, doesn't care about your race, religion, color, creed, it strikes everybody. Except the only place it does seem to discriminate is with age, right? It preferentially strikes older people. Um, they actually used to call it old timer's disease. Now, um, that being the case, it's only natural that a disease which preferentially strikes an older age is going to increase in incidence. We have a graying population. My dad is 73, we've got the boomers, everybody's getting older, so we should see an increase in a disease that prefer preferentially strikes older people. But please keep in mind, we are no longer talking about elderly people. We are talking about people in their 50s and 60s becoming afflicted with this, right? And something else to keep in mind as we go forward is that when it comes to things like type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease and, you know, obesity and all of these things, we take for granted that diet and lifestyle play a role in that, if not a primary driving role, right? Nobody even questions that, even within the conventional medical world. Nobody pretends like what you eat has no influence on your risk for diabetes or heart disease. So why is it when it comes to Alzheimer's? <laughs> We're totally clueless about this. We have no idea where this is coming from. We dismiss even the mere possibility that this could be every bit a diet and lifestyle disease, just like all the other chronic non-communicable illnesses that have exploded in incidence over the same time period as Alzheimer's disease. I'm going to make the case to you today that Alzheimer's disease is a metabolic condition. And when I say metabolic, I mean it has to do with the way the brain uses energy. And, um, how does it work? It's really important that your brain have enough energy. Depending on the source you cite, your brain accounts for only about 2% of your body weight, but it uses between 20 and 25% of all the glucose and oxygen in your body. It's an extremely energy hungry organ. Even when you're sleeping, even when you're watching reality TV and you feel your brain liquefying out of your ear, <laughs> your brain cannot have an interrupted energy supply. When the brain's energy supply is insufficient to meet its metabolic needs, the neurons that work hard especially those concerned with memory and cognition, are among the first to exhibit functional capacity, impairment of memory, cognitive performance. This is a big, I, I'm, ooh, I'm reading words on slides. Dr. Gerber said not to do that, but sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. Neurons are largely intolerant of inadequate energy supply, and thus the high energy demand of the brain predisposes it to a variety of diseases if energy supplies are disrupted. Although neurodegenerative diseases are not classically thought to be caused by disturbed metabolism, bioenergetic defects are emerging as important pathophysiological mechanisms in several disorders. One of the earliest signs of Alzheimer's disease is a reduction in cerebral glucose metabolism. File that away, we're gonna come back to it big time. But something else to, to know, just as a little aside, is that they are also identifying the very same disturbed neuronal metabolism in Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis so far. Um, 
Neurons have about a metabolic rate of about five times more than many other cells. They need a ton of energy. This is an energy supply problem in the brain. It's a fuel shortage in the brain. If we're gonna understand what's going wrong in the Alzheimer's brain, we have to take a basic look at neuron structure. So this is your basic neuron. Here on the left, you have the cell body, and there's a long, thin projection called an axon coming out of it that ends in these axon terminals. And this axon is surrounded by something called the myelin sheath. And the myelin sheath is made out of a substance called myelin that is primarily built out of fat and cholesterol, and we need a lot of vitamin B12 to synthesize myelin too. And the way that neuronal communication happens is it's like a, a radio station with a, a transmitter and a receiver. A signal is sent down the axon of one neuron, out the axon terminals, and received at the dendrites of another. So we have the synapses, right, the connections between neurons that look like this. As the brain is starved for energy, this is a fuel shortage in the brain, as these neurons do not have enough energy, in order to conserve energy to keep the cell body alive, the neuron retracts those axons and dendrites. It sucks them back in toward the cell body like a vacuum with a retractable cord. So instead of beautiful synapses that look like this, we have that. That synapse has been lost. Those neurons are no longer talking to each other. It is no surprise that someone whose brain has this happening is gonna have confusion and memory impairment and personality changes. And they can measure this on MRIs. They can see that the physical matter of the brain has shrunk. Um, skipping for time. Okay, if we're talking about an energy problem, we have to talk about mitochondria, right? Because this is where cells produce the vast majority of their energy. Um, so there might be a problem with mitochondria, um, maybe, if, whoop, if the amount of free radical species produced overwhelms the neuronal capacity to neutralize them, oxidative stress occurs followed by mitochondrial dysfunction and neuronal damage. And I actually think oxidation and oxidative stress are kind of getting a bad rap in the keto world. We do need some, you know, oxidation. It's a natural signaling function. You can't have healthy, normal apoptosis without it. But one thing, to, I mean, you don't want so much that it overwhelms the cell's ability to restore and repair. And Dr. Gerber showed this really nicely with the electron transport chain. One of the most damaging things to a mitochondrion is the constant, ceaseless influx of, of metabolites and substrates from glucose. Uh, mitochondrial dysfunction and the resulting energy deficit trigger the onset of neuronal degeneration and death. It's the energy deficit that's causing these neurons to, to malfunction. And it says neuronal death, file that away, we're gonna come back. These cells might not be dead. They might be doing something very, very elegant. So they might not actually be dead. One of the things that really fascinates me about Alzheimer's disease is they now regularly refer to this as type 3 diabetes, diabetes of the brain, or brain insulin resistance. And where this comes from is that the primary malfunction in the Alzheimer's brain is that neurons in affected areas have lost the ability to effectively metabolize glucose. The predominant abnormality in late onset Alzheimer's is a 45% reduction in cerebral glucose use. Don't you think if somebody's brain is using 45% less glucose than a healthy person's brain, don't you think they're gonna have a cognitive problem? Don't you think they might have some memory loss? I would imagine. Um, and by the way, that study's from 1994. That was a PET scan study. I mean, that's two, dec you know, two decades ago. To me, 1994 feels like it was last week, but this is not new. People, none of this is new information. I don't know why it hasn't trickled down to the average GP or the average neurologist. Impairment of glucose degradation is the basis for synaptic dysfunction underlying the impairment observed in this disease. It's the, the glucose degradation is impaired, the cells are starving, that's what's making those synapses degrade. Progress in understanding changes in brain energy metabolism during Alzheimer's has grown rapidly over the past three decades to the extent it is now widely acknowledged that brain hypometabolism accompanies Alzheimer's. Hypometabolism meaning too little metabolism, not enough energy. Three decades, I just said this isn't new. Who's been hearing about this for 30 years? I see, I see one hand, you must be a rock star, you must be like a researcher because for most of us this is brand new. Um, a prominent and well-characterized feature of Alzheimer's is progressive region-specific declines in cerebral metabolic rate of glucose. What does this mean in plain English? Alzheimer's is a progressive disease, right? It's um, nobody wakes up all of a sudden out of nowhere with severe dementia. It starts in a mild form, they actually call it mild cognitive impairment, and it worsens over time. 
And it is region specific, and we know this because at least at first, in the early stages, it's only certain regions of the brain that have this impaired glucose metabolism because somebody might become forgetful, they might be confused, but they can still care for themselves. Basic hygiene isn't a problem. Those things only become a problem in the very late stages of this when the whole brain is really overtaken. Reductions in cerebral glucose metabolic rate are associated with increased Alzheimer's risk and can be observed years before dementia onset. You remember from junior high when your teacher would stamp their foot because it was like the one thing you had to remember for the test? This bottom line might be one of the single most important things in this whole talk. This is not an old people disease. The decline in cerebral glucose use is measurable in people as young as their 30s and 40s. This is not an old folk disease, if it ever was. Um, the thing is, when somebody is that young, even though they already have a depressed cerebral glucose use, they're young enough and healthy enough that the brain is compensating. So they have no signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's. It's only when this has gone on for so long and the disease has become so widespread that they can no longer compensate. That's when you start showing signs and symptoms. But by the time that happens, this disease process has been in place for years and in some cases, decades. And I think that's why this is so hard to, um, to make a dent in. By the time you're even aware there's a problem, the problem is already very severe. Um, hello? No, where do I point this? Okay. As much as I love the phrase type 3 diabetes, because it hammers home immediately that this is a glucose insulin thing, at least maybe a glucose thing, there is a problem with that phrase. The problem with how we diagnose type 2 diabetes is that we only ever look at blood sugar, right? We only ever look at glucose. No one ever looks at insulin, except for some of the more progressive physicians in this room, um, you know, present company accepted. Most people don't ever measure insulin. And there's a huge list of um, chronic, modern, non-communicable illnesses associated with chronically high insulin, even when your blood glucose is normal. And we owe Ivor Cummins a debt of gratitude. This is all Joseph Kraft stuff, all these people that have high insulin but normal sugar. We can absolutely add Alzheimer's to this list. No? OK. So what's the deal with hyperinsulinemia? If you have chronically high insulin, you are at greater risk for Alzheimer's, period, end of sentence. Regardless of your family history, regardless of your genetics, you are at increased risk for this disease. I'm no good with this pointer. Up? Oh, somebody said to point toward the clock. OK, insulin resistance is usually at or near the top of the list of known lifestyle-related factors heightening the risk of decline in cognition in the elderly. The risk of Alzheimer's doubled in 39% of a prospective cohort study with hyperinsulinemia and was highest in people without diabetes. This is what I just said, right? These people aren't diabetic because their blood glucose is normal, but they're hyperinsulinemic and they have double the risk for Alzheimer's. Insulin resistance may be a marker for in Alzheimer's risk associated with the reduced cerebral metabolic rate of glucose and subtle cognitive impairments at the earliest stage of disease, even before the onset of mild cognitive impairment. This is our canary in the coal mine. The first dominoes to fall in this disease process is chronic hyperinsulinemia and reduced brain glucose metabolism. Um, what am I saying here? Did I lose my train of thought? Earliest stage of disease. So this, you, you physicians are in a unique position to identify patients at risk for this before it becomes a problem. Let me tell you one thing for sure. Memory loss and cognitive impairment and confusion is not the disease. Those are the symptoms. The disease of Alzheimer's disease is a deranged brain fuel metabolism. So again, everyone knows the phrase um, metabolic syndrome. They used to call it insulin resistance syndrome because we know it's driven by chronically high insulin. The links now between metabolic syndrome and cognitive impairment and cognitive decline are so strong that they now, tons and tons of papers on what they call the metabolic cognitive syndrome. Insulin resistant brain state. I mean, this again, this is not new stuff. Insulin resistance, uh, targeting the insulin signaling pathway during early Alzheimer's represents a viable therapeutic opportunity based on solid empirical evidence that insulin resistance, Alzheimer's pathology and related cognitive decline are mechanistically interrelated. You can't make this stuff up. Um, no talk about Alzheimer's disease would be complete without talking about the ApoE4 elephant in the room. The ApoE4 gene is currently the strongest known genetic risk factor for this illness. If you have one copy, you are at increased risk for Alzheimer's. If you have two copies, if you're homozygous, you have something on the order of a 50 to 90% chance of developing this illness. However, if you have a 50% chance of developing it, 
What does that mean? Yes, you have a 50% chance of not developing it. So what is it that triggers that increased susceptibility? What is it that flips that switch? Um, I think Dr. Ali alluded to this, or maybe it was, uh, no, it was Ivor, I think, in his talk, that the ApoE4 allele of, of, this, of this gene is the oldest in the human family. The ApoE2 and 3 are believed to have appeared later in human evolution. The ApoE4 was selected against in, in human populations with a long history of grain-based agriculture. So theoretically, at least, the ApoE4s are not suited for a high-carb diet. Um, this gene was really forged in our hunter-gatherer times, if not before. So the people with the E4 are just the least suited toward the way we eat and live in the 21st century. Um, and one thing, I, one thing to remember is um, you can have Alzheimer's disease without E4, and you can have E4 and not have Alzheimer's, right? Millions of people with Alzheimer's disease don't even have one copy of E4, let alone two. And millions of people that are homozygous for E4 don't develop Alzheimer's disease. There's tribal populations in Nigeria that have some of the world's highest frequency of the E4 gene. Guess what they don't have? Alzheimer's disease, thank you. So. Um, it's, E4 is not an inherently damaging allele. It's only deleterious in combination with a high carb diet, which is deleterious on its own. I'm not gonna waste my time repeating basically the same thing, just saying this E4 gene is not the cause of Alzheimer's. It's just the worst mismatch for what we have in the modern world. Um, so again, something else no talk about Alzheimer's would be complete without is the amyloid. You can't read any article in the popular press or the medical literature about this disease and not come across amyloid. Now, you're a smart audience. Who can tell me, what, what is this red fish doing in my slide? Yeah, I love me a smart audience. So that is a red herring. I'm not saying that the amyloid is a total red herring all the time, but it's not really what we think it is. It's not what we've been led to believe. It's not what the popular press makes it sound like it is. There is a lot of controversy over this stuff now. So what is amyloid? Um, there's something called the amyloid cascade hypothesis that holds that this amyloid stuff is the cause of Alzheimer's disease. And amyloid is a protein that is cleaved from a larger protein called the amyloid precursor protein. And everybody's brain does this. This isn't a problem. Um, healthy brains do this. Alzheimer's brains do this. There's no evidence that people with Alzheimer's over-secrete this amyloid. The problem is it's not cleared away. And because it's not cleared away, it accumulates. And it accumulates outside the cell. And once it reaches a certain concentration, it cross-links upon itself, forming these infamous amyloid plaques. And these plaques do get in the way of the synapses. They do block neuronal communication. So it's like, boom, slam dunk. This stuff is causing Alzheimer's. But there's many, many problems with this. And let's see what they are. So here, a basic schematic of the you know, here we have a healthy neuron. Here we have a, a, a plaque-riddled neuron. So, just like the E4 situation, you can have a lot of amyloid in your brain and not have Alzheimer's, and you can have Alzheimer's and not have a lot of amyloid in your brain. They are not supposed to diagnose Alzheimer's disease in a person who is still alive. They are supposed to diagnose you with Alzheimer-like dementia or suspected Alzheimer's. They're supposed to issue the official diagnosis upon autopsy when they cut your brain open and they, can, they look for these amyloid plaques. But there's all these people who die from Alzheimer's who are found to not have significant plaque buildup. And then there's people that die from other causes with no signs or symptoms of Alzheimer's and they do have significant plaque buildup. So either this amyloid stuff is not causing Alzheimer's or it's not the main cause. Low regional cerebral metabolic rate of glucose appears to be a very early event in the disease process, well before any clinical signs of dementia are evident, and well before cell loss or plaque deposition is predicted to have occurred. In a lot of Alzheimer's patients, this amyloid stuff is a late player to the game. This is not the first step. The first dominoes, remember, are the reduced cerebral glucose, the chronic hyperinsulinemia, because some people never even really build up a lot of these plaques. And, um, there has, so if, if amyloid is the cause of this disease, then if we could have a drug or some other intervention that reduces the formation of these proteins and plaques, boom, silver bullet for Alzheimer's, we've just cured it or made a big dent in it. Well, there's been several of such drugs developed. Every single one of them has been a massive, massive failure. 
And I say that they've been failures, but they've been successful in that they do actually reduce the formation of these proteins and plaques. The reduction of the proteins and plaques has never been shown to have any positive impact upon the disease progression. You get rid of the plaques, everybody with Alzheimer's gets worse. It does nothing to stop this disease. Um, the phase three clinical trials of one of these drugs had to be terminated early because the people on the drug were doing so much worse than the people on the placebo that it was deemed unethical to continue. So every time we get rid of this amyloid, people get worse. And there's a new school of thought, we're going to have another slide coming up on that, that this amyloid may actually be protective. It may be the body's way of defending itself. But nevertheless, we've totally, um, oh, here we are. I changed the order of my slides. So this is from Dale Bredesen, who's written a book called The End of Alzheimer's, highly recommended. He's doing some very small but very promising clinical trials of trying to reverse Alzheimer's with diet and lifestyle interventions. The production of amyloid is a protective response. Just getting rid of it without knowing why it's there makes very little sense. Um, formation of beta amyloid may be an element in the brain's defense against oxidative stress. Remember all that oxidative stress from that constant ceaseless influx of glucose. Uh, oxidative stress may provoke the protective release of amyloid. Oxidative stress is among the best inducers of amyloid precursor protein and consequent beta amyloid production. Um, so the enzymatic release of amyloid under conditions of neuronal stress is thought to be aimed at reducing oxidative stress, preventing cell death, and promoting neurite outgrowth and tissue regeneration. More and more and more, this amyloid stuff is being shown to be neuro-reparative, neuro-regenerative, restorative. We see a lot of amyloid secretion in traumatic brain injury and CTE, the chronic head injuries, probably for the same reason. This is a protective thing. Now, this is where you earn your CMEs. This is a geeky thing that I don't normally include in this talk. I've been saying that Alzheimer's disease is impaired cerebral glucose metabolism, right? Well, shockingly, one little party trick that amyloid has evolved to do, or whatever has managed to do, is it inhibits an enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase. For all you nerds out there and scientists, pyruvate dehydrogenase is this PDC, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Pyruvate dehydrogenase is the bridge between glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. It's the bridge between fully metabolizing glucose. We have glucose converted to pyruvate. Pyruvate gets conceded, converted to acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA goes into the Krebs cycle to make energy in the cells. So, um, if we inhibit pyruvate dehydrogenase, we're basically impairing glucose metabolism, right? So that's PDC. Amyloid is killing that enzyme. So we're basically putting the brakes on glucose metabolism in these cells. So, oh my God, another slam dunk against amyloid. But again, amyloid is not a huge issue in everybody. This is a late player in most Alzheimer's patients. And if I can anthropomorphize this amyloid or the cells of the mitochondria, if you'll bear with me, if I was a cell or a mitochondrion that was already so damaged and so glycated and so oxidized from years and years of, of nutritional insult, mostly from over-consuming glucose, I would put the brakes on this to protect myself. I would say, I don't care how much glucose you give me. You can keep drinking your orange juice and eating your pasta and your bagels and your cereal. You can flood me with glucose. I ain't going to metabolize it. I'm going to secrete this amyloid to protect myself. And that's, I mean, that's speculation. That is speculation on my part, but I think it's a, the, the brain isn't secreting this amyloid for nothing. And it's probably not being secreted to kill us and to give us Alzheimer's. Um, so if, uh, if I can <laughs> remind you of any analogy, um, we, here we have this amyloid. We've demonized, fingered this one substance, amyloid. It's causing Alzheimer's. If we could just get rid of it, we've cured the disease. Except that's exactly not what we see. So, Amyloid is to Alzheimer's disease as cholesterol is to cardiovascular disease. We've probably, or at least maybe, uh, misnamed, misidentified a, a, a perfectly helpful, natural, normal substance. We try to get rid of it every which way we can, and people get sicker and sicker. So thank goodness more and more researchers are coming on board with the fact that this amyloid hypothesis has got to go. What am I doing wrong? The possibility must be considered that current therapies designed around the bulk removal of amyloid may not simply fail, but be actively harmful by hindering the very functionality they hope to preserve. Millions of research dollars, private and public, are annually expended on anti-amyloid therapies that do not work and are based on a logically flawed hypothesis at this point in time. It is no longer unreasonable to, to suggest that further iterations of anti-amyloid therapies may not be in the best interest 
of Alzheimer's patients, I couldn't agree more. Anytime you read an article, especially in the popular press, but even in the medical literature, about CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, whatever your news or fake news of choice is, um, if you hear about some new blockbuster Alzheimer's drug, please bear in mind, it is never ever an Alzheimer's drug, it is an anti-amyloid drug, and every single one of them has failed so far. That doesn't mean that there might not be a beneficial one in the future, but I wouldn't put my money on it. Their conclusion of the study could not have said it better. The amyloid cascade hypothesis is no longer supported by the majority of evidence, if it ever was. Amyloid-centric therapies will continue to fail. Um, okay, so I've been saying that this amyloid is protective. So even if that's true, even if this amyloid is a beneficial thing and the body is doing itself a favor by secreting it to, to reduce the influx of yet more damaging glucose, that doesn't mean that this amyloid can never ever get into trouble. Um, kind of like cholesterol, right? Um, so how can we bring this back to insulin? So I said that Alzheimer's patients do not over-secrete amyloid. The problem is that it's not cleared away. Oddly enough, be prepared to have your mind blown. One of the things that is primarily responsible for clearing amyloid is an enzyme called insulin-degrading enzyme, IDE. So I always say that parents with more than one child don't pick a favorite child. They always claim they love everyone equally, even if it's not true. Um, enzymes do pick favorites. Enzymes have higher affinities for certain substrates and targets than others, right? So um, insulin-degrading enzyme has multiple things it can work on, multiple substrates, two of which are obviously insulin and beta amyloid. The affinity, so insulin is the favorite child of insulin-degrading enzyme. Um, the affinity of, of IDE for insulin is so high that as long as there's appreciable amounts of insulin to be dealt with, um, the IDE is going to go after the insulin and neglect all its other stuff to build up, including amyloid. And we see this over and over. Under hyperinsulinemic conditions, insulin competes with beta amyloid for IDE, leading to the formation of uh, senile plaques. IDE might be competitively inhibited by insulin, resulting in decreased beta amyloid degradation. It was shown that elevated insulin levels in type 2 diabetes, and I would argue any hyperinsulinemic condition, regardless of what the blood sugar is, induces um, the accumulation of amyloid through competition with insulin. Now, it's kind of, so the, the ApoE4s, remember I said they're the least suited for the modern diet and lifestyle. ApoE4s produce less insulin degrading enzyme. We can speculate as to why, but it's not that they have no insulin and no insulin-degrading enzyme, but they produce less of it than the other ApoE genotypes. And it may be, again, speculation, it may be that that gene was forged in a time where people weren't awash in insulin and they didn't need a lot of insulin-degrading enzyme to get rid of it. Um, so, and I, I'm gonna have to cut some other slides out. I'm gonna be pressed for time, but I want to like little tidbits about insulin in the brain. Why, so, oh, let, let me, let me finish first. Why is it a problem that amyloid is building up? So even if, even if the amyloid is helpful, protective on some level, if it gets to be too high, it does become a problem. Um, I, I compare it to a fever. A fever is your body's way of raising your core temperature to fight off some kind of invading pathogen, right? But if the fever goes too high, then the fever itself is a problem. And it's the same kind of thing with amyloid. The amyloid may very well be protective, but once it starts to build up and accumulate and form these plaques, it does block neuronal communication. It does impair healthy cognition. But the question is, why is it building up? And it's building up because of chronically high insulin. So again, these little tidbits about insulin in the brain. Insulin, uh, glucose uptake into the brain, for the most part, is not insulin dependent. You don't need insulin to get glucose into the brain. There's GLUT3 at the blood-brain barrier, there's GLUT, uh, no, GLUT1, there's GLUT3 in the neurons, GLUT5 in the microglia. These are not insulin-sensitive glucose transporters. Nevertheless, insulin crosses the blood-brain barrier, there's insulin receptors all throughout the brain, so insulin is doing something in the brain. We don't even know what yet. There's a, like a lot of research remains to be done, uh, not just about insulin, but about Alzheimer's, a lot of unanswered questions, but insulin is doing something in the brain. And people with Alzheimer's disease, even though they're hyperinsulinemic in the periphery, in the body, they have been shown to have lower insulin in the brain and the, and the cerebrospinal fluid than healthy age match controls. And they do experiments where they actually administer intranasal insulin. They give you insulin via a nasal spray. And some of these Alzheimer's and MCI patients do have improved cognition, at least in the short term. But is, you know, do we want to do that? Is that the answer? Like giving a type 2 diabetic more and more and more insulin? Do we want to give these people more and more insulin or figure out why the insulin that's already there isn't working? or that it's not getting into the brain. 
Um, we're going to talk about some additional obstacles to healthy cognitive function. I'm only going to go over two. There are some pharmaceutical drugs that are very common among our elders and even among our not-so-elders, and I have to move quickly. Your stomach is acidic for a reason. Healthy brain function, healthy cognitive function doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? We need zinc, we need iron, iodine, choline, there's all this B12, we need all this good stuff to make healthy brain function happen. So um, if, if you're taking a drug that deliberately impairs digestion, impairs your body's ability to absorb and assimilate these critical nutrients, you might have some cognitive problems. And um, forget, forget all this glucose and insulin stuff. A B12 deficiency alone could cause cognitive impairment and neurodegeneration. This is not an uncommon thing in people that have been on PPIs for a long time. So they've done some associational studies, observational studies between long-term PPI use and increased risk for dementia, and they found some associations there. We, we don't prove cause and effect, we don't know for sure, but when you think about the criticality of these micronutrients for the brain, it's not exactly a huge logical leap to see that there might be some plausible mechanism there, right? I am so glad that Drs. Diamond and Damasi and, um, and Ali and Ivor and everybody spoke before me because I can skip a lot of this cholesterol stuff. I will, I will say some of it though. Ah! What just happened? <laughs> that's, that's the universe's way of telling me to speed up, I know, but I'm not ready to go that fast. Okay. So this is directly from the FDA's website. Non-serious and reversible cognitive side effects, memory loss, confusion, and again, we know about increased risk for type 2 diabetes in statin users. The FDA continues to believe that the cardiovascular benefits of statins outweigh these small increased risks. The cardiovascular benefits, if there are any, and that's up for debate, outweigh the small increased risks of memory loss, confusion, impaired cognition. First of all, if it's my loved one, my family member who is literally losing their mind don't tell me that that's a small risk. Don't tell me that that's a small thing, no big deal. Um, and so let's, what does this mean in plain English? The cardiovascular benefits outweigh the risk for cognitive decline. Well, congratulations, sir, you win. You have the lowest cholesterol in the dementia ward. I mean, whoop, that, that's what we're aiming for here. So um, this is well, well known, uh, well known side effects of these drugs, or, or not even side effects, really. I mean, just effects. There's no such thing as a side effect. When you look at the mechanism by which statins work, I can't imagine why they wouldn't impair healthy cognitive function. Um, so uh, increased reports of cognitive impairment, memory loss, forgetfulness, confusion. They're generally not serious and are reversible upon statin discontinuation. Well, that's great, but how often do physicians tell their patients to stop taking their statins, present company excluded again? And I'm not a physician, I'm not telling one to stop their statin, but if anything, we see the dead opposite, right? We see fear-mongering, you will have a heart attack tomorrow if you stop that statin. Or, or threats, I will fire you as a patient if you don't take this statin. So we don't see people, oh, you're losing your mind, stop your statin, no, we see the dead opposite. So I can skip over most of this. This first quote is actually from one of the papers that um, Dr. Diamond was an author on, but over and over and over again, it's been shown that higher cholesterol is associated with better, you know, longer life, healthier life, and especially with better cognitive function. So what are we going to do about this? Um, if I didn't think there was something we could do about it, I wouldn't be talking to you. I wouldn't have written a book about this. Um, Alzheimer's may be similar to obesity, coronary artery disease, and type 2 diabetes in being a consequence of the conflict between our paleolithic genes and our current neolithic diet. And I think something I forgot to say when I specifically focused on the ApoE4, but it's applicable to any, anyone that has Alzheimer's, is that, you know how they say genetics loads the gun, but diet and lifestyle pull the trigger? So ApoE4 is not pulling the trigger, it's diet and lifestyle that's pulling the trigger. So. No, no, oh, okay. So I've been saying all along that this is a fuel shortage in the brain. This is an energy crisis in the brain. And it's specific to glucose, right? This is impaired brain glucose metabolism. If that's the case, wouldn't it be awesome? Wouldn't it be so great if there was like some other fuel that we could give the brain? Some other alternative fuel substrate that these neurons would be able to metabolize, these otherwise starving cells. Shot in the dark, bear with me. Have any of you ever heard of ketones? <laughs> oh, you have, you have, fabulous. Okay, I knew I wasn't talking to amateurs. 
So um, ketones, as you know, are an excellent, elegant, beautiful fuel for the brain. I notice I didn't say emergency backup fuel, last ditch effort fuel, but a perfectly normal part of human fuel energy metabolism. This is one of my all time favorite lines from the entire scientific literature on this disease. Throughout much of human evolution, ketosis likely served as a valuable survival mechanism to fuel brain metabolism during times of food scarcity, and I would argue, during times of carbohydrate scarcity or carbohydrate unavailability. Hence, in some ways, the modern diet can be considered keto deficient. How great is that? Now you know why it's my favorite, second only to this one from Stephen Cunane, who does some really amazing research in this area. Hang on to your hats. Two points are clear. Alzheimer's is at least in part exacerbated by, if not actually caused by, chronic progressive brain fuel starvation due specifically to brain glucose deficit. And attempting to treat the cognitive deficit early in Alzheimer's using ketogenic interventions is safe, ethical, and scientifically well-founded. This isn't a religious revival, but how about a hallelujah? So, Remember how I showed that pyruvate dehydrogenase and beta amyloid is impairing brain glucose metabolism, right? And this is clearly a problem. If, if this whole disease is an energy shortage to the neurons and beta amyloid is impairing the use of energy, well, but, but I also said that, that that's a protective mechanism. This paper was phenomenal. Beta amyloid compromises glucose utilization, but without providing ketone bodies as an alternative fuel, what is meant to be a survival program is perverted into a death program. Here's the deal. If you have a brain that is starving for glucose, but you have some ketones, it's really no problem. Maybe you'll have slightly impaired cognition. You know, maybe you won't be perfect, but if you have an alternative fuel coming in, it's no problem if the other fuel is no good. But if you are chronically awash in insulin and you're not able to make ketones because you're chronically awash in insulin and you can't metabolize glucose, then we have a problem. So how do we raise ketone levels? There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, I'm gonna really focus only on the bottom two. If this is a, a, a metabolic problem with metabolic origins long before somebody starts to show signs and symptoms, then we need a low carb diet, we need a ketogenic diet, we need exercise, we need fasting, we need certain supplements that may improve insulin sensitivity and glucoregulation. But if you have somebody who is very severely demented in a very severe advanced stage of this disease, good luck getting an 82 year old man with dementia to give up his morning bagel and grape juice in favor of eggs cooked in butter. It's being a caregiver is the hardest part of this disease. It's hard enough to do that job, let alone trying to force somebody to make changes they don't want to make. They're belligerent, they're uncooperative. In those cases, I absolutely support the use of coconut oil and MC2 oil or exogenous ketones, because if the major problem here is that these neurons are starving, then we need to feed them, and we need to feed them any way we can. And the exogenous ketones will do it, the coconut oil and MCT oil will do it. But I say that taking those measures is like bailing water out of a leaky boat without stopping to patch the hole. All you're doing is managing the crisis, managing the symptoms in the short term. Remember, the cognitive impairment and memory loss, is that's the symptoms. The disease is the metabolism problem. So if you want to fix this or, or potentially prevent it, and I, I'm very careful to say potentially, um, then, then you need to eat and live very differently. And I'm going to skip reading these. You can take a picture if you want. But I get asked very often, how do I prevent this? Can we prevent it? I wish that I could promise you, yes, you can prevent it. I don't think we know if we can. I think we can. I believe we can. Um, and I'll get the question, you know, um, I'm 50 years old. I'm 60. I'm 70. I've been eating starch and sugar all my life. Is it too late? Do I already have one and a half feet in the Alzheimer's grave? No. Um, I don't think it's ever too late, first of all. And I don't think you need a ketogenic diet to prevent this. Don't kick me out of the room yet. I'm going to explain. Um, once somebody is already in the disease process, yeah, that is not the time to mess around. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Hit this as hard as you can from every angle you can. But in order to potentially prevent it, I don't think you need a strict ketogenic diet, right? We have billions of healthy people all around the world who live, you know, age gracefully into very old age with all their cognitive faculties intact, and they're not following ketogenic diets. So no, you probably don't need a medically therapeutic keto diet to potentially prevent this. What you do need to do is eat and live in such a way 
way to keep your insulin and blood glucose levels in a healthy range. The amount of carbohydrate that any of us is going to be able to consume and still accomplish that is going to be different. Some of us are gonna need 20 or 30 grams or less. Some of us can do 150, 200 grams and be fine. I mean, not, not most of us, but the, you know, the, the genetic outliers out there that can do that. So, um, I don't, you know, I don't want to demonize all carbs. It would be ridiculous for me to tell you that cantaloupe causes Alzheimer's or lentils cause Alzheimer's. Again, healthy people all around the world eat this stuff, but they don't eat a lot of the other stuff and they live very differently. So, um, how do, how do we, you know, how do we prevent this? A, I, I think we need a nutrient dense, lower, low-ish carb diet. Some, if you enjoy living life at 20 grams or less, do it. There's no reason not to. But if you like a slightly more liberal diet, I don't think you're going to, you know, increase risk for Alzheimer's by eating strawberries every now and then. Um, I think I might have finished. So if I can leave you with any message, there is hope. I don't think this is a hopeless situation. Um, we've seen some very, very promising, but still preliminary, minor reversals, improvement. If you look at Dale Bredesen's studies, and I said you can measure the shrinkage of the brain on an MRI, he has proven regrowth, regrowth of those neurons, regrowth of those axons, so it is possible. Um, I really recommend his book. Um, and that's it, thank you for coming. I hope that this was helpful.